Amen. Well, open with me in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 12. And we're going to look at just one verse there to begin with on the subject of why he came. So why did Jesus come to this earth? You know, at this time of year, it's so easy, I think, to get caught up in all of the, the busyness of the year. You know, your people are running around buying gifts and wrapping gifts and making cookies and going to family dinners and traveling to get to those gatherings. And, you know, there's so much taking place. It's so easy just to just get caught up in all the busyness of the season and to really forget why he came. And so it is essential that we stop and worship together and remember exactly why he did come. And so this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit will break your heart with a remembrance of what he has come to do. Because he came to do that for you, not your next door neighbor, although that is true too, but he came to do that for you. And so I, I hope that you'll take this this morning and make it personal, because it is a very personal thing. So why did he come? Well, before we get into that, I want you to think of the alternative. The alternative to him coming. You see, that would be the opposite of everything I'm about to share with you here this morning. And I think that's important for you to remember there is a possible alternative. And that alternative is that God could have said to mankind, to everybody down here on earth, hey, you know what? You want to live independent from me? You want to disobey me? You want to do your own thing? Go for it. Have at it. You made your bed, now sleep in it. He could have said that, but he didn't. And oh, I am so glad he didn't. And I bet you are so glad that he didn't. Because we would be in a heap of trouble without him today. And so I encourage you, you know, if you remember the alternative, he could have left us in our sin, but he did not. He came to set us free. So why did he come? Well, the first is, reason is stated here so clearly by Jesus in John 12, 46. He declares here very simply, he said, I have come. So there's the statement. This is why I have come. As a light in the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Now with that statement, you come to the natural conclusion that I am in darkness. The world is in darkness. And that conclusion would be correct. This world lies in darkness. It's groping in the darkness. Now remember what it was like when you were groping in the darkness, trying to figure out what is it all about. What is life all about? What is the purpose for my life, my meaning in life? And that is groping in the darkness. And it's a, it's a very difficult thing. We all know so many that are still groping in the darkness today. They're searching for something, some reason for living, some reason to make sense of life. And we need to be praying for those folks and we need to be sharing the gospel with those folks because just remember, you used to be in that particular place, groping in the darkness. You know, this is really the reason why people search so intently in philosophy, why they search in history and psychology and the occult and every new religion that comes around the block. It's, it's an essential thing to really realize that is what I was searching for when I was in school. I was a history major and I was searching for some kind of reason 
for why the world is the way it is. Why is this place the way it is? And that, that question never really was answered. All there was was more frustration until I came to know him. And so Jesus made it very clear in John 9, 39. He said there, For judgment I have come to this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Now he's referring there to the Pharisees. Those that, if you look at the context very clearly, he's talking to these men who thought they saw, and he said they literally would be blinded. But notice the first part of that statement. I have come. I have come that they might see. That they might see. See what? Well, see the truth. See the reason why they are alive. See the reason and the meaning of life. And then see the path of how to obtain it. How to experience that life. And so John 9.39 is very clear. I have come to this world that those who do not see may see. And so that's why he came, so that you could see. And the only way you can see anything is you have to have light to see, right? Now, have any of you ever been in a place of total darkness? Have you ever taken a, like a trip into a cave? You know, you go into a cave, deep in the cave, and they, any cave uh, tour... They always turn the lights out, right? And when you get to the end of it, they turn the lights out and they say, now this is total darkness. And you can't even see your hand in front of your face. That's what it's going to be like for anyone apart from Christ. They will go into what Jesus said is outer darkness. And so we were in that darkness at one point. And yet the only way we could see anything was for his light to come shine upon our path. And that's why you're here today. That's why we have received him as the true light. So how does God shine this light upon mankind? There are many ways that he does this. The first way he shines light into mankind's path is basically through creation. Creation is one of the most powerful messages that God uses every day and every night. In Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, there David said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. It shows his handiwork. It reveals his powerful handiwork. And it says, Day unto day utter speech. And night unto night reveals knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge that there is a God. And so whenever I share the gospel with people, I always turn their eyes to the creation. I always usually begin there because it's such an obvious uh, explanation and revelation of the existence of God. And then secondly, he gives us light through our conscience. In Romans 2.15, there Paul says that God's truth in the Gentiles' hearts, he said, does this. It shows the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. And so this is one of the ways that God reveals light. He gives a man a conscience, which is the proof that God writes his law in every single human heart. This is why a person knows that some things are absolutely wrong and other things are good because their conscience bears witness to that fact. Their conscience makes them feel guilty or their conscience makes them feel really good when they do what is good and what is right. So that's a way that God shines light. And then just Christ coming into the world to teach and to preach the good news. It says in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 
And that is truly what he did. Just as he came, he gave people light and understanding about how to experience real life. That's why he calls it here the light of life. You see, it's light upon what real life is all about and how to obtain it. Very powerful. And then last, he gives us the ability to shine light upon others' paths by our preaching of the gospel. Jesus told Paul in Acts 26, 18, he told Paul that he had called him to preach the gospel, and he said this will enable him to open the eyes, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so Paul preaching the gospel turns people from darkness to light. When you preach the gospel, you turn people from darkness to light. What a privilege is that. And so I hope that you're using and exercising that privilege to proclaim the gospel to others. Because it's like you've turned on the flashlight in their darkness. And what a privilege is that for each one of us. You say, well, I'm, I'm too afraid to do that, Steve. Well, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you with boldness, fill you with love, fill you with that, that sense of that this is right, that may your conscience motivate you to proclaim the truth every opportunity that you have because it's shining light into someone's life. Just by you being here today, light is being shown upon your path, especially if you're here and you don't know Christ personally in your life. Light is being shown into your life. Now, secondly, Jesus came to give you real life in your soul. This is why he came. Jesus states it clearly in John 10.10. 10. He said, the thief does not come to except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. So this is the life that he brings to light. And so this light shows us that there's something more to life than what we have yet experienced. And when a person believes that message and they receive his forgiveness, life comes into their soul. Now, why does forgiveness of sins bring life? Because the scripture says the wages of sin is what? Death. So that's what a person experiences inside. They experience death inside. And it's just that emptiness. It's that gnawing emptiness that is inside a person's soul. And we've all experienced it, haven't we? And so when you receive forgiveness, there is life that naturally enters in inside of you. And then Jesus begins his work. That work of bringing and giving you life takes place this way. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when Jesus came to Nazareth, his own hometown, he turned and he proclaimed, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So what he does is he first comes and he heals your brokenheartedness. You see, the world has the distinct ability to break you, literally, to break you inside. And your own sin breaks you. It's, it's constantly breaking you down. And he heals that brokenness. That's what he came to do, to heal the inside of you. You see, when you hear people say, I was a broken person, remember those words because Whenever you hear those words stated by someone, 
in their struggle of their life. Just remember, Jesus heals the brokenhearted. That's what he came to do. And so when he does that, he then sets a person free. He sets them at liberty. He declares that they are free from the power of their own sin and their own sin nature, which is a powerful and awesome thing. Now, how does that take place? It's by the entrance of the Holy Spirit. You see, in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it says the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So life comes by the spirit, the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus. So if you feel like you're dead inside this morning, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit brings life and that life brings freedom from your struggle freedom from whatever is holding you and so the holy spirit is what is the person who keeps you free he not only heals your brokenheartedness sets you free he keeps you free as you surrender and yield to him what a, a glorious truth is that now, thirdly, he came to bring hope where there is no hope. Now, if there is anything that is the testimony of history, it is that there is really no hope for mankind. Now, do you realize people, you know, you've heard the statement, you know, those that forget the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them? Well, that's the testimony of man. He's constantly repeating the same problems, the same faults, which brings about the same end every single time. So why is it that no republic in recorded history has ever survived more than a couple of hundred years? Why is that? Because man is the same. All men are the same. Soon as men figure out that they can game the system and they can use the freedom for their own ends, then they do just that. And that is why the Greek Republic, the Roman Republic, and every other republic that has ever been has always failed. And our country is on the same trajectory. We're heading in the same direction. I hate to say it, yes, our country and a republic is the best form of government there is. But it is run by people who cannot learn their lesson. And they are sinful. They are selfish. And that is why there is no hope. But the hope I proclaim this morning is that there is another kingdom. There is another kingdom that you can enter into that sets you free from that whole cyclical system. It sets you free and one day you will enter into a heavenly kingdom and there is one to come. That's what gives you hope. You know, the hope is that you can be forgiven and you can have a completely new start in life. You get to start over. Wow, is that not cool? I mean, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And literally that in the Greek uh, verb there, become, is becoming new. You see, it's a constant becoming new. And so that is the incredible hope that we have, is that we can change. The world around us is not changing. It is, as John said, the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. And, but you do not have to be under his control anymore. And then the ultimate hope is our king is coming. In Titus 2.13, it says, looking for the blessed hope, 
and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And one day, he is going to come and set up his kingdom here on this earth, which will never be destroyed. Now, that is the only kingdom that will never be destroyed. Because world kingdoms have come and gone by the scores. They come and go. And this one will come and go. And yet there is one who that will never go, will never be destroyed. So why has the Lord done all this? He's done it because he is the God of hope. He is the God of all hope. He gives you hope. He came to bring you hope because that is who he is. He's the God of hope. Romans 15, 13. There Paul said, may, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Well, believing what? Well, believing in him. Believing that you can be forgiven of your sin. Believing that you can have that new start. Believing that you can be set free from your own sinful nature. Believing that there is a kingdom to come. That's where you get joy and peace in believing. That's where it takes place. It's a powerful thing. And so he declares there that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so not only does the Holy Spirit give life, but he gives hope. And so if you're feeling hopeless today, I, I encourage you, look to where your true hope will be found. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the greatest reason for hope today is knowing that there is something after this life, that this is not all there is. Now, you know, I have had people near their own death say this to me many times. Is this all there is? Have you ever, has ever any of your parents or family members ever said that to you that didn't know Christ? It's, it's a pretty sad thing to hear when you hear that statement, but I've heard it many times. Is this all there is? And your answer to that is, no, there is something more than this, and you can have it today. And that person who makes that statement can have it that day, if they will simply put their hope, their faith in the God of hope. Paul said this in Acts twenty four fifteen when he was speaking about the resurrection of the dead. He said, I have hope in God. There it is. Which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. Now, let me say this. If you aren't following Christ, that's a terrifying statement. Absolutely terrifying. Why? Because it means that everybody will be resurrected to life. Everybody has to, will live forever. Everybody stands and must give account for their life. If you're in Christ, you're in a good spot. If you're not in Christ, that's not a good spot. It's not a good place to be. But notice he says here, there is a resurrection. That's why he said, I have hope. And so there is something more to this life than any of us have ever seen. Now, fourth, Jesus came to bring joy when all you want to do is cry. Joy. Do you know that this was the message of the angels? This was the very message the angels brought to the shepherds out in their field. And there, one of the angels, it says, declared in Luke 2.10, then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to who? All people. All of us here can have great joy this morning because that's what he came to do. That's, this is the declaration of the angels. He came to bring great joy. Now, why is that? Well, because we know the answer. We know the truth. We know where this is all 
going. Jesus said in John 17, 13, he said, now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So this is why he came. He states it right here. I came so that you could know the truth. He says, so I, I speak the things that I speak in the world. That's how he brought the gospel, the truth of the message of that there is freedom, there is forgiveness, there is a new start, there is a kingdom that will come. And you can have life now. That all is why I should have his joy. Notice, Jesus said, my joy fulfilled in themselves. Do you have his joy fulfilled in yourselves this morning? That's the promise. That's what you can possess. That's what you can have today. And yet, sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes, you know, you're listening to the evening news and, you know, as my wife sometimes, she says, honey, quit talking to the TV. <laughs> they can't hear you. And you just kind of forget. They're blinded. They don't see. And so I, I assume because you all laughed, you do the same, <laughs> right? It's frustrating sometimes, isn't it? But you have to retreat to what you know is the truth. And when you do that, there is joy. You turn your eyes to the truth and the opportunity that you have to proclaim that truth to someone else. Now, fifth and last, the supreme reason I believe Jesus came, and because this is the bottom line reason. The supreme reason he came is so that you could see his love and experience his love. That's why he came. John 3.16 is about as clear as you can state. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He's saying, I loved you this much. This is why he came. This is why I've sent him. And he wants us to see that love and to truly perceive it and receive it personally. Now, love is probably about just the idea of love is probably one of the most twisted things in our world today. I mean, the understanding of what real love is. Real love, I think, is, is understood and experienced by so few. The word is used all the time, every day. But real love is something that is defined by the God of love. You see, that's real love. Love is something that's first, it's pure. It's holy. It is unadulterated. It has no ulterior motive behind it. It's a pure thing. And that love is something that God wants us to see. Because people say, oh, I love you. Well, most of the time they mean, I lust for you. That's what they're really saying. Or, I want something from you after you are deceived enough to believe this. You see, you say, oh, Steve, you're so cynical. No, I'm a realist. Okay? That's reality. Real love has no ulterior motive. It doesn't. And you say, is there anybody that experiences that? Oh yeah. Christians experience it. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love. That pure love. That's what he will give. God's love is, it gives. For God so loved the world that he gave. And he gave sacrificially. You see, it's pure it's something that gives. It's something that gives sacrificially. It's a powerful thing. 
It initiates that giving. It communicates its love. That's what real love does. It rescues, it redeems, it transforms, it serves. That's what real love does. And there's so many other adjectives that we could use to describe what real love does. And that's why Jesus came, so that people could see this is what real love is like. You have to see it to believe it. And that's why he came. And if he did not come, then I don't think we would ever have a, the truest example of what love is. Jesus said, I have given you an example so that you will go and do as I have done to you. So however the Lord has treated you, that's true love. And then he wants you to turn around and treat others in the same manner. But to experience this love, you have to believe that he loves you. You see, that's the key. Not he loves the world, he loves you. And do you believe that? You see, if you believe that God has ripped you off, if you believe that God is, you know, is a mean guy that, you know, is has robbed you and taken from you, then you're not going to experience that love. But those are lies. Because the proof is Christ's coming. And so when people say to me, oh, God has done this to me, God has done that to me, and, you know, I don't think he is a God of love, I just always point them back to Christ coming for them. Because it's the ultimate proof. I mean, because God could have said, forget you all. I, I, I don't want to be bothered with you. You want to do your own thing? Go for it. Enjoy your life. But he didn't. He said, I will redeem them. I will come for them. I will show them. I will communicate to them. I will sacrifice for them. I will wash their feet. I will die for them. That's the proof. That's the ultimate proof. And so if you believe that he loves you, then you can experience that love. In 1 John 4.16, it says this, We have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. And so this is why he came. When you believe his love, you will receive his love. When you receive his love, do you know what happens? You will choose to obey him. Why? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love him, you will listen to him. If you love him, you will follow him. That's what love does. And so when two people, people love each other, they are united. When God and man love each other, they are united. They come together. And there is a, there is a power that is released inside of their life, inside of your life, that you cannot find any other place on this earth. The reality of that is one of the most powerful things that you can ever experience. Now, let me just close with this. I've told you all of the reasons why he has come. Let me give you a reason why he did not come. Okay? Just the opposite. The negative. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mark 2.17. So, I did not come to call the righteous. So if a person thinks, I'm a good person, I'm, I'm righteous, I, I do great things for people, he did not come for you because you're blind, literally. If you know you're a sinner, then you're the person he came for. He came to call you because you know and you have heard his, his voice inside. 
It's a powerful thing. You know, everybody in this, this room right now here is a sinner. Every one of us. No question about that. Some of us need a first-time repentance, and others of us need a renewed repentance. You know why I, I know that to be the case? There's the very first thing that Jesus preached when he began his ministry was, is found in Mark 1.15. There Jesus said, the very first thing he says, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Now, the word repent is in the present tense. The word believe is in the present tense, which literally should state continually repent, continually believe the gospel. So it's something that you need to continually do. So every one of us in this room, I guarantee you there's something we can repent from if you're a believer or you're not a believer doesn't make any difference. So I encourage you this morning, as we, as we wait upon the Lord, as we worship, in just a few moments, we're going to be singing a couple more songs here. I want you to just meditate on that. Lord, is there something you want me to repent from, to ask your forgiveness for? Attitude, words, actions, any, any of the above. A lack of service, a lack of giving, a lack of worship, a lack of surrender. I don't care, whatever the issue might be. But ask him to speak to your heart because he will do that. He will touch you. He will make himself known because that's what he came to do. And if you sense in your soul there's something there, just turn from it because that's probably one of the greatest gifts you can give to him, okay? It's just turning to him in repentance and in faith. Trust him that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is his promise. Amen? Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that, Lord, you came. And, Lord, we thank you for stating the reasons that you came so that we might be absolutely clear on this fact of what you want to do in our lives. Lord, we thank you for shining your light upon our path. Lord, shining your, your incredible truth upon our hearts. Lord, giving us life and hope and joy so that we might know your love in every area and every respect of our life. Lord, I thank you for just what you've done in my life. I thank you for what you've done in, in these here gathered together this morning. But Lord, we do come with a heart that knows its own sin. We know our own faults and failures. Lord, there are many. They are ever before us, as David said. And so, Lord, we, we pray this morning. Lord, I pray that you would touch each believer here with that understanding of, Lord, how you want each of us to turn and to follow you more closely, to yield to you, to surrender to you. And if you're here this morning and you have never made that commitment to Christ. You're not following him. But you know you need to. Will you surrender your heart to him this morning? You see, the Holy Spirit is touching you at this very moment. And there's, a, there's a sense, a need. You see your need. You see the, your own faults, your own failures, your need for him. That's the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. All you have to do now is confess that to him. Ask his forgiveness and invite him to come in and take over your life. And when you do that, he will begin to bring that change that I've spoken about here today. 
If you want to do that, I want you to pray with me right now, right where you sit. You just say, Lord, I come to you as a sinner. I acknowledge my sin. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. I want to be your disciple. I want to begin to follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. And change me. Change my life. If you just prayed that prayer with me this morning, I'd like for you to do just one simple thing, and that is to acknowledge your a confession of faith. Yes, I prayed with you today. If you did just pray with me, would you just lift your hand here as a simple acknowledgement? God bless you. Anyone else here this morning? Lord, we pray you'd touch this heart, touch this life. And Lord, I pray that you would just bring that, that life, that joy, that strength into her, their soul. And I believe you're doing it even at this moment. Keep, we pray, by your power, by your strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.